Throughout history, the biggest reason that Im immigrants have come to Garden City is because of jobs. Um, and then at the turn of the century, we had the need for railroad, railroad workers. That's kind of a... Anyway, um, and so that's when we saw the first influx of Mexican workers and Japanese workers come in. And ever since then, throughout the, the history of Garden City, as we've had different booms, is what we call them, we had the sugar beet factory in 1905. Um, that brought in not only Mexican workers from Mexico because of the revolution, it brought in German um, immigrants as well because they were very familiar with sugar beets because Germany grows a lot of sugar beets. Uh, almost four years. How do you came to Garden City? Uh, I came to Kansas six years ago, and I was in that city, and I used to come over here to play soccer with my other friends from that city, and I noticed there's, you know, Garden City, there's a good, good place to live, it, and I decided to move out of here in 2013, so. Uh, as, as simple as when I applied to be chief of police a little over a year ago, and when I provided my presentation as part of the process. In the background I did, there was, in the school system, there were 31 languages that were spoke, spoken. Today, there's 35 languages spoken. So in a little over a year, we added more languages. Garden City has been studied a lot by different anthropologists because it's a great example of how diversity works. You know, there's not a lot of small towns in the United States where, you know, their high school has 40 plus languages being spoken in. And Garden City is a great example of that. You know, we have people from across Asia and the Middle East and Africa coming here for the reasons I mentioned before, jobs and security. And it's a small enough town where like a strong community is there. Um, yeah, it's, it, you know, Garden City has advertised itself as a beacon for diversity. And I believe that's why it was specifically targeted by these individuals. They wanted to squish that. So uh, I work on Fridays and I got this message that they wanted me to go down to the Somali community and take a bunch of photos because there was a foiled bomb plot and I didn't know what was going on. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty close with the Somali community and so I, I drove down to the neighborhood um, where I knew this happened and I just started asking around. Um, there's a building there that uh, one of the apartment buildings they converted into a mosque. Uh, you got carpets all over the floors and Quran, and the rest of the apartment is empty. And they worship there every Friday. And so I went over there and I spoke with a few of the, the Muslim leaders, because I knew they would know what was going on and I'd get some of their reactions. Uh, when I showed up, uh, there was several other media organizations already there. Um, I believe uh, Adam Shrimplin was shooting for Reuters that day, and uh, several of the local TV stations were there already interviewing people. And so uh, <laughs> it was pretty crowded. Um, to describe the neighborhood, it's, uh, it's just a couple apartment buildings in a U shape. And so you have the buildings on the outside and then another row on the inside. And uh, the attackers had planned to plant cars with bombs in them at the four corners of this U. And uh, the mosque is at one of the, the corners there. And so uh, I'm not sure how many, how many Somali people live there, but I would guess it's about a couple hundred people. Um, the three men published a manifesto explaining the reasons why they wanted to do this attack. And you know you can read and see all of their reasons there. Um, but I, I believe that because Garden City was such a beacon of diversity, that's why uh, we were targeted. And really, the whole community was targeted by it because the Somalis are part of our community. I, th I think as a whole, we were shocked that it was our town because it's always been like New York or Chicago or Sh California, not Garden City. And so I think it kind of opened our eyes that, you know, we are not above reproach 
and we are not above having some issues like that, and, and, and maybe we need to look at some things differently. The concern, or the uh, uh, plot, had a uh, impact on the community as far as uh, I, like any other individual in the community, were totally surprised that such hatred could be uh, portrayed towards uh, mankind and that it was uh, uh, being planned here for the attack to be uh, carried out here in Garden City. It was focused on two different apartment complexes and those apartment complexes housed hundreds of people and any such incident could have, would have harmed additional folks um, driving along Mary Street or living in surrounding houses. Well, obviously the Somali leadership was concerned about safety. I mean, they, their place of worship was just targeted by a car bomb attack. And I don't, I don't know how much you know about Somalia, but uh, back in Somalia, there's a terrorist organization called Al-Shabaab. And they frequently use car bombs as a way to kill massive amounts of people. And a lot of these Somali refugees are just that, they're refugees. They fled violence, often on foot, from Somalia up to maybe Egypt, and then to Europe, and then eventually made their way here. And so they've traveled a long way in search of just a peaceful place to live. And this attack, or this foiled attack, shows that this violence followed them here too. I, I believe some Kansans fear the Somali people because they think they are terrorists, or there's a terrorist among a large group of people coming in and they're going to bring damage to the United States. But what has been historically proven now because of this attack, there are more attacks by other people on the Somalis than the other way around. I'm ticked off. I'm not happy, you know? And it upsets me that those families, the Somali families, and the Burmese families that live there were scared to death. They just want, they came here for the same reason my, my grandparents came here, for a better way of life for their family. And this is how you're greeted? It's scary. Uh, it was right here in the Meredith Street and it was a mosque and there's 120 people who live out there. But there's not only Somali people, there's a lot of different races, different religions, different colors live that farm. But the main target, I think, was the, because of, there's a prayer room out there. But you're always going to have a few people out there that are just um, renegades and do bizarre things and act bizarrely without any regard to the fallout. You know, kind of like the incident that happened. I don't know that they really thought, thought through what the fallout would be two, three, four blocks away. It would have destroyed my house, you know, and the fact that Gunner's grandpa lived just right there. You know, I don't know that they totally thought that out, but sometimes that's the, what is the word I want to use? The mentality that we got to fix this, and it's like you're not going to fix something. That, that's not fixing it, it's destroying it. And in, that, in the process, you're going to destroy a lot more than what you think you are. It's hard to say uh, how many people would have been hurt if this attack succeeded, but uh, I'm sure guesses would range uh, into about several hundred people would have been hurt. Um, they planned it for the day after the election as to not sway people either way in their voting. Um, but the, I'm you know, in reading on how they plan to attack, I believe they planned on blowing up some of the bombs and waiting so that responders could arrive and then they'd blow up more. Um, and so, I don't want to spread mis misinformation about this. I don't know their exact attack plans and I don't know how many people would have been hurt. We're just speculating at this point. So on October 13th, I met with the FBI and was briefed. On October 14th, I met with my staff here in the department and we came up with a, a, a strategic plan to that it was necessary to reach out to the community because we knew at four o'clock there was going to be a press briefing 
Um, to do so, I had to reach out uh, with my staff and the department to those that this plot was going to impact, primarily impact, and that was members of the Muslim community, primarily Somalians and Burmese. And we visited with, um, as a staff we visited, and we reached out to the East African Community Center who responded to the law enforcement center with tribal leaders from the African communities. I met with them along with the FBI and I explained to them uh, that uh, a news briefing at four o'clock was going to occur and that they uh, need to listen to what the FBI had to say, what the U.S. Attorney's Office had to say, and that the individuals involved were in custody at that time and that uh, it was paramount that we meet with everybody that we can in the apartment complex. They agreed to uh, meet with everybody they could and then at, um, uh, while they were doing that, my staff and personnel put together a letter to, uh, that was uh, translated in several different languages and it was worked with other resources to send that letter out to the neighborhoods at 312 and 305 West Mary. Those letters basically said, we need to visit with you regarding your safety and concerns that were portrayed in a four o'clock news briefing. The U.S. Attorney's Office gave their briefing at four o'clock. Thereafter, I started watching the news and I saw that uh, uh, there were several members of the community that were being interviewed by the media and they were portraying their fear and concerns of their safety whether or not uh, they could send kids to school, whether or not they could go to a mosque, uh, go to work, play out in their front yards, so forth. So I, I felt that the decision to have a meeting on the 15th of October at 1 o'clock in their parking lot of their residence was important. I showed up and my staff showed up and while we were waiting for the meeting to begin, we had uh, officers that were out there playing soccer with the children and interacting with the folks. We interacted with the folks as well. Um, and then we briefed them that uh, what transpired was a horrible act and that the acts were uh, diffused and there was no longer a threat to them. I encouraged them to, that they were safe, that everybody was in custody that was involved to go ahead and go to their mosque, go to their um, work, uh, go to school, and, in, and enjoy their everyday life. I also made sure that they understood that this was not an attack on, on uh, them, that this was an attack uh, that was, uh, the, the attack that was plotted was fo uh, foiled by an investigation yeah, they do pray, and uh, after that we they do uh, candlelight night, and they come with us in the in the, in the, in the Murray Street, the, the place that Target was, and they show us that they not a uh, they not a uh, get away from us. They just be with us, and they gonna protect us. They will stand for us. So law enforcement in Garden City, they show us that they always protect us, and they always standing for us that we all are Garden Cityans, no matter where we come from, but we do live here in Garden City. After that, uh, we were up there for about a little over two hours and had a good discussion with them. The following Sunday, um, there, there were groups of community folks that did a um, gathering and they had signs out there in support of Garden City. That show of support really, I think, helped establish with the Somali community that Garden City is here for them. From churches and other organizations gathered around that neighborhood that was targeted the next day and held up road signs saying that we love you and that they supported local law enforcement, they waved American flags, they sang songs, and people arm in arm with Somalis 
and you know, people stood arm in arm, whether or not they were from Somalia or from America or from anywhere else. You know, a lot of nations were represented on that small neighborhood road that day. Following Saturday, I met with uh, the uh, president of the African Community Center. I also met with um, 15 tribal leaders from the African Community Centers. And every one of them felt safe. And then that Saturday night, there was a, um, a, a candlelight walk that was put together by uh, a local resident as well as members of the Ministerial Alliance to support uh, our community. Uh, because they, they, they make us, that, they show us that we save because of the eight months investigation, the go local government to keep doing it and they come to us and they talk to us and they tell us everything they have, de they have done for us. And all the people living in Gaddafi City come talk to us and apologize whatever happened, whatever was trying to, you know, whatever was planning. And every people keep telling us, are you guys okay? You know, are you guys feel safe? You know, we want you to be safe. You know, this thing, if, if, if this problem will happen, it wouldn't bother only Somali community. It will bother everybody. Because if something happened in Gaddafi City, every person live in Gaddafi City will go away or will feel there's something else come up. And I think, that we as a people have to realize that throughout the ages we've gotten along with each other by um, accepting each other for our differences but also integrating within the community. So I would like to tell the people and show them or, or share with them that we all want, you know, we don't have to hate each other, we don't have to kill each other, we don't have to there's no religion says that, you know, kill someone, you know. There's no religion, any religion not allowed to kill people or other people or do anything wrong. So we need to be understand why are we in this world at that point. And it's like we have to be together and peaceful and lovely. We were all immigrants at one time and came to this country. Uh, some of us were born here, but it all started with immigrants coming in. And when we recognize that uh, in, in community we are a unit, we're unified as one, that's important. Uh, my dream is just like to have a better life and people see, love each other and, you know, my dream is I will be, you know, the person that uh, show the people that they, the right way and lead them the right way and the right path, you know, and make the people united and show them that there's one people in the world and one <clears throat> One God and one believe, and there's you know, I just want people to understand we all come from the same, and we all ended up the same place. Garden City benefits from the Somalis in several ways. First of all, it's an eager workforce willing to work jobs that a lot of people are not, and so they fill vital roles in a lot of our manufacturing and beef industry jobs. Second of all, I think any community is benefited by a diverse group of people. You know, they say that travel destroys ignorance. Well, you don't have to travel far to be in several different countries right here in Garden City. And so we are really blessed with that. Um, you know, I believe the Somali people as a whole are a kind, family-centered group. You know, they, they're peaceful and you don't see Somalians causing trouble here in Garden City more than any other group. We will do what we can to protect everyone, but we need to keep in mind in a reality that this is a community of over 30,000. We don't have 30,000 officers out on the streets. So the only way we can work uh, to try to protect as many people as we can is by working together.